Struggling to move your nonprofit forward? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Nonprofit Architect, where we are giving you the actionable steps you need to launch and grow your nonprofit organization. Now, here's your host, Travis Johnson. Do you feel your nonprofit's not getting enough in monthly recurring donations? If so, then you need sharing the credit. Every time you go into a business and swipe your debit or credit card, one of the fees taken out by Visa and MasterCard at the end of the month goes back into the system. Now, normally this is a bank, but it is legally allowed to go to a registered nonprofit. Sharing the credit worked with a small local nonprofit. They took this information to their donor base and 19 businesses started using sharing the credit. Now, this small local nonprofit receives $11,000 in monthly recurring, unrestricted, ongoing donations. This is the definition of sustainable funding. Businesses have to take plastic, so they might as well use part of those fees to support their favorite cause, your nonprofit. Check out my affiliate link in the show notes for sharing the credit. Book a call with Will Black and start your journey to more donations and better relationships today. Hey, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Sybil Ackerman Munson, host of the Do Your Good podcast and a whole lot of other cool stuff. Sybil, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Travis. Thanks for having me on your show. I'm excited to talk about all this stuff. All right. All this stuff. What are we going to talk about today? Uh, We're going to talk to donors and funders, which we don't do a lot of, even though these are some of my favorite conversations. Specifically, we're going to get into things like, how do you know what type of funder you are? How to make sure your money's being put to good? How to really understand who it is that you're giving to, what to look at, what to look for to make sure you're going to be a right fit. And then we're also going to talk a little bit to the nonprofits of how to connect with these types of individuals. So simply, if you could give us a little bit of who you are and what you do. Yeah, totally. I'm on a soapbox to help donors give their money away effectively because I worked in the nonprofit world as a nonprofit person who had to raise money for over a decade. And then I switched over to work for funders. And for the last over a decade, I have been working for donors, helping them give money away to well-deserving nonprofits. And I've sat in so many different trustee meetings and worked with so many different donors around giving strategies that I started seeing patterns in how people were doing things. And I'd see times when they do things really well And I'd also see times when they literally were wasting money and leaving money on the table. And it really stressed me out. (laughs) And so that's why I created my my new arm of my business called Do Your Good, which is all about teaching people, donors, how to give money away effectively. And I also am supporting nonprofits and helping them approach donors in a way where they can maximize their pitch and raise money and that kind of thing. So over just to give you some perspective on the kind of folks I work with, I've helped people give away over $45 million in donations, both large and small. So both smaller donations and like super, super large ones. And so there's strategies that you can give money and make a difference no matter how much money you give away. And I also really work a lot with donors to help them collaborate with other donors so that on an issue they care about, so they can be more effective together, you know, that kind of thing. So there's just so many things I love to talk about related to this work. And I'm happy to answer questions, Travis, because I I feel like you might want to talk about some specific pieces based on your audience. Oh, absolutely. One of the big questions that I get asked is, how do I know if this nonprofit is doing what they say they're doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a really big deal. There's a lot of strategies you can use to make sure that you know that the nonprofit's doing what they have said they're going to do. Because first of all, a a nonprofit is going to come to you and what they'll do if they're any good at their job is they'll try to pitch you what they think you want to give to them about. So that's going to be a problem for you because you might not get down to the real nitty gritty of what they're actually doing. If they know that, let's say you love watching birds 
they're going to try to talk to you about how they work on bird issues, <laughs> or if you love to plant trees, or if you care about global warming, or if you care about houselessness, they're going to try to angle their pitch to you based on any of those things. Now, that's a good thing if the group is actually working on those issues, but it's not such a good thing if they're trying to just get money from you. And you'll waste money, valuable time and money doing that too. So here's some tips and tricks I have for the donor to make sure that you can give money to a nonprofit you care about. The first thing is for you to sit back with yourself and journal a little bit on four key points. I want you to journal about who you are as a person. So if you want to give money away, a lot of the first mistake I see is that a donor will say, I want to give money away. I have a little extra money to support the nonprofit world and our community, but I feel like I should, should be giving money to like the big heady issue like houselessness or climate change or something like that. That's a big mistake. You shouldn't do that first. What you should do is sit down with yourself and say, what are the things I care about? What speaks to me? Because there's a do good nonprofit doing something connected to no matter what it is you care about. There's good people out there. So no matter what it is you care about. So sit down and journal and think about, first of all, what is it that you do in your daily life? No judgment there. Like, what do you do in your daily life? And write that down. Then think about what your hobbies are. What are the things that you do as a hobby that make you happy? It could be anything. For me, it's running and I love horseback riding. You write it down. Then the next thing that you want to do is sometimes you might have things you do in your daily life. You might have your hobbies, but there also might be places you love to go or something you like to do that you might not do every single week, but that really gives you rejuvenation in your life. For me, I love going and going you know, camping on the coast in Oregon. It's amazing. And I take my horses there. We gallop down the beach. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't get to do that almost ever. But <laughs> when I do, it's such a great thing. And if I'm trying to relax, I bring myself in my own mind back to the beach, right? So that's the thing to do is think about that. And then the last thing, last but not least, is to really think about what it is that keeps you up at night. What do you worry about? What's the challenge that you think about a lot? Okay. And write that down. For me, when I did that exercise on myself, I found I had tons and tons of things, right? I have a lot of hobbies. I have a lot of interests. I'm sure you do too, like everybody does. But what you'll do is if you write all this down, you'll find a through line of things. And for me, what happened was I, I love my family. I love my kids. Um, I care about the thing that keeps me up at night is climate change. I might have a whole lot of other things I, I want to do and care about, but I realized I actually know a bit about the climate change issue and I know a little bit about my kids. And so I ended up donating to in nonprofits that work with youth on climate change issues. But for any other donor, it could be any number of things. The reason I'm going here when you ask me, like, how do you monitor and make sure that the nonprofits are doing what they're saying they're going to do is the only way you can really tell if the nonprofits are doing what they're saying they're going to do is if you're giving to nonprofits that are a part of you, that you know about because you care about, because it's something that you're doing in your daily life, because it's something that you think about. And so that's the key, because then you'll know if that nonprofit's not working on the issue you care about, because you'll know about the issue so well, because it's connected to who you are. Okay. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is a lot of times people ask me, how do you monitor? Like, okay, you've figured out who it is you want to give to. You sort of can tell if they're aligned with your interests, but how do you over the years make sure that they're continuing, that nonprofit continues to be aligned with your interests? Because another big mistake that can happen is you start giving and then you just sort of get busy with daily life. And then you, you like aren't as connected, even if it's a nonprofit that's sort of doing similar stuff that you care about. What you do is, I love this idea because it's just so much fun. You know, every year, you, a lot of times folks do like New Year's resolutions, like I'm going to do this or that every year. What I suggest is you treat your giving like a New Year's resolution. So you write a little note to yourself at the end of the year and you say, okay, I just gave to XYZ group. This is why I did it. This is what motivated me to do it. This is why I was so psyched to do it. But write it down, write it down. And either on paper or in your computer. And then put it away in an envelope, stick it in a, in a, in a drawer or in a file on your computer. Don't look at it for a little while. But then the next year, when you sit down to write your New Year's resolution about the groups you gave to and what motivated you to do it, open up that envelope that you wrote from the year before to see if it's if you still have the same passions and interests as you did last year. You might be surprised. I'm talking to you about this because I actually do sort of a more in-depth kind of conversation, which I call dockets with my trustees who give away multi-millions of dollars. So what they do is they're a little more formal. They've got um, 
you know, usually it's a family foundation with family members, not just one person or outside experts that are on the board. And so they do dockets where they do really detailed assessments of the issue they care about, but they check in with themselves twice a year, three times a year. And I organize all that. I do lots of in-depth reviews of the nonprofits. And then I talk with the trustees to make sure that we're still in line with what their interests are. And so you can do that in a really intense way where you hire an intermediary like me to help you do that analysis, or you can do it on your own in a much more simple way, which is literally to write yourself a letter. Say, this is what motivates me all the time. That's a super helpful way to do it. I do want to talk to you too about the three different types of donors. And if you're a donor to really hone in on which kind of donor you are, so you can show up for the nonprofit the right way. But let's stop there about like, how do you like make sure you're monitoring and watching? Are there any other questions you have about that part? Oh, I've got tons of questions. So like, I I haven't even got started yet. Good, 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 Travis. (laughs) Not being in alignment with the things that you personally care about is a mistake. Yes. What happens that tells that person that that's a mistake? What happens if it if you think you're if you're giving to things you think are out there but not really? What happens to the process? Like I want to give for world peace, even though I, maybe I don't care about it. Now, if you're listening, to this be like Travis, you don't care about world peace. I'm, like, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about a hypothetical person. But Travis, I love, see, the thing is that you were just talking to yourself about that part, world peace. I actually work for a foundation. One of their goals is ending war and world peace. So (laughs) I love that you brought that up because I actually literally am living that question. Let's talk about that a little bit because even your self-deprecating thing where you said, oh, people will be like, oh, you don't care about world peace. See, that's the little judgy thing we have in society, right? Um, And so you feel like guilty a little bit because you're not giving to that area, right? That's what I want you to get rid of. And the reason why I feel so strongly about this is I, I've been working on working with donors for so many years and I literally have seen the situation where people go, oh, well, I feel like I should be working on world peace. So therefore I am going to, and you know, nothing about world peace, like how to actually get there. None of your friends care about it every day when you're waking up in the morning and thinking about what you're going to get done that day, there's nothing about world peace in that day. I mean, maybe you're peaceful, but <laughs> the, the strategies around world peace, there's nothing that you're dealing with day to day on that issue. Now, as a side note, the foundation I'm working with that works on world peace, they actually are working on it every day and it's part of their life. And that makes it okay. But if it's not, do not work on it, right? Why? Why? Yeah. Okay. Why not? Yeah, I'm about, I'll give you a story. I'll give you a story about why not. Okay. First of all, I'll give the big picture. Why not? The big picture why not is you will have no idea whether the nonprofits you're funding are effective. And I have seen that happen. And so what will happen is you'll give grants to these nonprofits. They'll be happy to take the money, but you'll have no idea if you're giving to the non- a nonprofit that's doing actually working on it 100% or not. I'm going to give you a story about the problem here. When I was in the nonprofit world, in the beginning of my nonprofit career, I worked really, really hard and I didn't talk to funders very much. And I actually did a ton of work on a lot of issues. The people who were really good at fundraising from different nonprofits took my work and raised money based on my work. And I know this because I ended up getting a job at one of the nonprofits that was raising money based on my work. And I became a staffer there and read the proposals that they were submitting to the foundations. And the proposal were based on work that I had done at a different nonprofit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you are somebody who's a donor, there's no way you can parse through that unless you actually are passionate about the issue you're working on and you know the people who are doing the work. Mm -hmm. Then you know to give your money to the place where the people really have their heads down are doing the work. And if you care about it, if you're doing, if it's something you're doing every day in your normal, regular life, or if you, if it's a place you really care about or an issue you actually have been thinking a lot about and reading about, then you can suss that out. So you literally can give money to the wrong nonprofit that way. And then it'll actually end up having you waste money because if you're giving to a nonprofit that's not actually doing the work, then what ends up happening is you notice, oh, they're not meeting their benchmarks. They're not doing this and that. What's going on? And you get frustrated and then you stop giving altogether or you've literally just thrown money out the door. So that's just one one example of the of the challenge there. I wanted to bring it back to something you said and... I've been in the Navy. I was in the Navy for 22 years. I know how to cuss. I can, I'm fantastic (laughs) at it. 
of all the skills that I have, that's one I can do it without even knowing I'm doing it. But I have found a few things that I feel are worse than cuss words. And you said one, and I'm not mad at you, but you were <laughs> bringing it up in the light that I agree with. You feel like you should be giving or working towards something like world peace. Should, I think, is worse than cuss words. Should, just, and nice are my three least favorite yes. words. Oh, I should be doing this. Should, should. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got to we've got to be more of who we are. If we're always worried about the things that we should be doing, we'll never get where we're supposed to be. Well, and not only that, Travis, it's not, it's, I agree with you on the should. And if you're saying should in your giving strategy, then you literally are going to be wasting money because most likely, because you just aren't going to be as connected to what's happening. And like I said before, and I want to repeat it because I think it's so important. I've told my kids this over and over too. Whatever you care about, there are amazing nonprofits doing good work. So let me use horses as an example, because I'm a crazy, loving horseback riding person. I am not personally giving in this area right now, because when I've done the work, my own work on this, I end up focusing on climate change. However, I totally see a path in my future of potentially doing, giving more in the horse, horse area because, okay, I love horseback riding. I love trail riding. I do it for my own personal pleasure. However. There are some amazing nonprofits out there rehabilitating horses that are off the racetrack, working with formerly incarcerated individuals, or even within the prison system to support prisoners who are then working and taking care of horses and animals. And it really helps them come back into society in a positive way. Horses are wonderful for therapy for children with disabilities. So there's just all these cool nonprofits doing amazing stuff out there. And so that's the kind of thing it's like, and, and I know about horses, I know about the issue. And I actually have thought a lot about, okay, Sybil, maybe I should be doing that too. That, you know, climate change might be, is something really important, but you know, this is also important. So that's the kind of conversation I'm having with myself that I wanted to share with you, because I think it's the kind of conversation that's important if you have something to give back especially with any funding that you might have. Really think about that a lot. How do you determine what kind of funder you are? And before you answer that, I already know what type of funder that I am. So I know without a doubt that the number one most important thing to me in nonprofits is sustainability. And I know this because that's what I care about. That's what I talk about. That's what I harp on when I get into these conversations is sustainability. And my personal opinion, at least for me, is that if I'm going to give and I'm going to give to a nonprofit and they've got one person running everything, I know that they're not sustainable. I know that if they're not working on developing their craft and learning about this stuff, listening to podcasts, reading books, going to conferences and learning how to do nonprofit work, they're not sustainable. I, in my opinion, if you're not paying yourself or working towards paying yourself in the nonprofit world, I don't believe that you're sustainable. And why would I give to an organization that might not be around next month because the founder or the executive director refuses to train anyone else on how to do the work? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you definitely care about the nonprofits that you're funding year after year. You really want them to, to sustain. And that's one thing I talk a lot about is there, are, in my experience, there's three different kinds of funders, a sustainer, campaigner, and launcher funder. I'm going to give you the overview of the three different types, and then we can get into detail about each one so that hopefully your listeners, if they want to be an effective donor, they can think about which category they want to focus in on. And I'll talk to you also about like why that's so important. Why, if you don't really do this kind of work, then you also could be wasting money and time, both of the nonprofits and your own time <laughs> and get disillusioned. I want you to keep giving, right? <laughs> the difference between a sustainer, campaigner, and launcher is a sustainer cares about a nonprofit because it fits completely in line with what they want to do in the world. A sustainer donor cares more about the particular nonprofits that, they, that they're funding than maybe the issue even. Like if you think about it, you, you might care about that. You've done all the work and that nonprofit is working on an issue you care about, but you've, it just is sort of defines who you are as a person, this group or a couple of groups that you're funding. So that's a sustainer donor. You want to fund that group or groups over and over again, year after year, you're completely committed to them. A campaigner donor cares more about changing a societal norm 
they're worried about an issue in the world. They care more about that, like houselessness or climate change than they do about any one particular nonprofit. And again, I feel like there's a lot of judgment that you put on yourself if you're actually a campaigner donor, but you say, oh, no, 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 I actually care about sustaining year after year. You have to be true to yourself. If you really care more about moving the dial on an issue, then it's a different kind of giving strategy. And it's really important that the nonprofits know that right up front. It's worse if you say, I care so much about this issue, nonprofit, but I really care about you too. But then you start meddling with the nonprofit and saying, well, can't you work more on this part of the homelessness, is- houselessness issue or climate change? Because, you know, I see this and this, and I read an article here and here, and I'm really a sustainer donor. No, no, no. Just own it. If you're a campaigner donor, you want to move the needle on something. And I can talk to you about strategies to really own it and do it well rather than mess it up. And then the third kind of donor I see is a launcher donor. A launcher donor is similar to a campaigner donor because a launcher donor cares about moving the needle on a particular issue. They care about that more than any one nonprofit. However, the difference is a launcher donor is more like a venture capitalist in the business world. They love filling gaps. They love coming in and funding something really intensively for two, three, four years maybe even starting a whole new nonprofit because a particular issue isn't covered to move the needle on something, a particular part of that. Like maybe there's not enough communications or media strategy around moving the needle on an issue, or maybe there's not enough grassroots advocacy, or maybe there's not enough scientific research. There might be a gap there. And so this person wants to come in and they want to really fund that gap and help the whole community move the needle on an issue by doing that. It also might mean they like add money to a particular nonprofit they've been funding so that nonprofit can start a whole new arm of their work. Okay. So those are the three different kinds of donors. I feel really strongly that it's important that if you're a launcher donor, that you're really clear also with the nonprofit. You say, okay, I want, you tell me nonprofit, what is the gap? Okay. Here's the issue I care about. I know you're working on this issue. What's the gap that needs to be filled? They'll tell you. The nonprofits are experts. They know what the gap is like, oh my gosh. But you have to ask them because a lot of times a nonprofit will want to talk to you about what's in their own strategic plan and, and try to find all those pieces. And then they'll say it. And then you'll say, okay, cool. So let's talk about how we can fill that gap, how I can support you. Usually it means too, as a funder, um, you're going to be collaborating with other funders. You also ultimately, if you're create, filling in a gap, you're going to want to fill in a gap in a way where over time, sustainer funders will come in because you're only going to fund as a launcher funder two, three, four years. You want to support the nonprofits to create a budget and a plan that's going to bring in the sustainer funder. So you can see how sustainer campaigner and launcher funders, really when it works well, they all work together super well. If you don't identify yourself as one of those three up front and really say, this is how I want to approach the kind of giving I'm doing, then like I said before, you can definitely Uh, make it confusing for the nonprofit and for yourself. And over time, you can get really disillusioned if you're not clear on that part. Yeah. You see this a lot in in leadership where they have a certain thing that they care more about than another thing. And then depending on the type of leader they are, if they're putting their efforts into this area, whether or not they're a micromanager, which may or may not be helpful to who you're trying to support. Yep. Yep, exactly. So I've seen happen a lot where And it's happening even more recently where people are trying to say, donors are trying to say, we want to fund and do multi-year grants and we want to really support the community and we want to do that. I love that. That's wonderful. The problem is, and the missing piece is that all of the donors are saying that, but they're not approaching it the same way. Because if you're a campaigner funder and you say that, it means that you're interested in a nonprofit that's working on that issue. So you need to say that too, because what'll happen is a whole bunch of nonprofits will come in and see like the general interest that you have and not understand why you're not giving to them, or it'll get really confusing and they'll spend time on it and then they'll get grumpy. And the community does talk, you know, the community that's working on things. And you don't want to be one of those donors (laughs) where the community's like, oh my gosh, (laughs) we have to go through so many hoops for that person. And who knows if we're even going to get funding from them and they're so unclear. And, and I have to tell you, I'm sure I've done this for so many years. I've 
made those mistakes before with my donors. And luckily I have good enough relationships with some of the nonprofits I work with where they've been able to tell me. I've been like, Sybil, you know, this isn't really working that well. (laughs) (laughs) But that's because it's been years and I was from the community that I now fund, right? So it's a lot of people that I've known and knew as a nonprofit partner too. Um, I'm glad that they were able to tell you where you might be deviating from the vision. I am a huge fan of feedback. And a lot of people are like, really? I'm like, oh yeah, I try to mess up as much stuff as possible because I know I've got more humility than ego. And I know that I, I can't possibly be doing it all right. So if you're listening to this and you're like, Travis, but I like, I need to tell you something, please, please tell me if I'm doing something that just drives you crazy, I promise I'm not doing it on purpose unless your name is just kidding. I'm not going to put a name in there. I don't know. <laughs> You yeah. know, most people, the vast majority of people don't try to intentionally antagonize somebody. They really don't. The vast majority of people, if they're, they're doing something that bugs you, they have no idea that it bugs you. None whatsoever. And if you don't tell them, you're the only one suffering. Yeah. You're the only one suffering. Do them a favor. Be nice to you and make sure you're given the feedback necessary to make your day better. If you don't, you're going to be suffering. <laughs> Yeah. And that, that leads to some, though, there, there is really an important thing that I ha- I created a little mini course on this, which is to support donors in staying out of what I call a funder bubble, because I agree with you, Travis, that it's really important that funders get feedback, but they don't get feedback from nonprofits enough. And what happens is if you're a funder for year after year after year, and you haven't been in the trenches with the nonprofits before, you can really lose touch um, because nonprofits just won't tell you that you're approaching them wrong, that kind of thing. And like I've said before, like nonprofits have, I've been lucky enough that they've told me, <laughs> but I'm sure they haven't told me every all the time. And so I actually sat back with my with myself and also I observed some things with some of my clients and I put together this mini course, like I said, which talks about how you as a donor can purposefully, I think donors have to purposely work really hard to keep themselves out of that funder bubble. And it means putting yourself in slightly uncomfortable positions where people don't necessarily think of you as a funder so that you can remember that things aren't always so peachy. First, before I get there with those tips and tricks, I want to tell you a story about why I'm so motivated about this is, you know, I was in the nonprofit world for a long time. And I was doing a lot of coordinating with lots of other nonprofits around really hard issues. At one point I was a lobbyist uh, working on environmental issues and those are not easy issues, right? And people disagree all the time. And I was trying to, I was actually in leading a court, a coordinated group of environmental organizations and conservation groups and others. And we were working on all these things and not everybody agreed on strategy. Not everybody agreed on things. And so every day I would be navigating these things. I love doing that stuff. That's what I love doing is trying to work with people, navigating through hard issues and trying to get through to the other side and finding compromise. But I was doing that. And then one of the funders who had been funding some of the work, not the lobbying part, but some of the public education part, they came to me and said, Sybil, would you be able to run my foundation? And I said, I'd love to. And so I, that's how I started being a donor as I was a full-time executive director at One Family Foundation. So I moved over there and I, I had about two weeks transition between my nonprofit job and then this job. And I left that job, the nonprofit job, went into my office. The first day I walked into my office at the foundation job, I turned on my computer, I opened up my email and every single email is, Sybil, how you doing? <laughs> Life's great. I can't wait to talk to you. Let's go have coffee. There was not a single like, Sybil, what are you doing with that policy? I don't agree with it. Why, why, don't compromise too much. Blah, 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 blah. Let me talk to you about this. I mean, I'm going to go talk to this person and try to get go around your back. And, you know, and I love, again, don't get me wrong. I loved being in the middle of all that too, because it's so important. It's how compromise is made is honest, good conversation. And so when, but when I walked into that, my office that day and turned on my computer and saw that I said to myself, oh my goodness, this is, this could be really dangerous because I can't just get the happy emails. I have to know what's really going on. And I have to make sure that the community knows that they can still get funding, even if they make mistakes and I'm going to make mistakes too. And I need to hear, hear it from folks. And so that's why, you know, I've always kept that in the back of my head as I move forward. And that's why I created this mini course, because 
over time, you know, I, I've started actually working for many, many different funders and the original foundation that I was the executive director for is still, I still work for them. They're my client now. And now I've watched so many different meetings like this and some folks that I work with, unfortunately, they'll be in a meeting and it's been so many years that they've been donors and they may not have, not have ever been in the nonprofit world themselves. You can see it happening where they like come in and they say something and then everyone sort of realigns to that statement. And so you never actually get the information from the nonprofits about their, what they're working on, that kind of thing. And so that's why I, I created this mini course to talk about it. We can talk about my strategies in a sec, but I want to stop there to see if you have any thoughts just about the big picture. <laughs> yeah, I've got, a, I've got tons of thoughts. Please do. Yeah. Let's talk about that first. It sounds like just like the podcasting world is the similar to running a foundation. All your communication is happy communication. Everyone wants to talk to me because I'm a podcaster. They're excited to see me. They're excited to be. That's one of the reasons I love podcasting so much. But it sounds like in the foundation world that those rosy comments are just really masks for what's going on. You're not getting all the information you need to be successful to make good decisions. I find that it's really interesting. I run a couple of mastermind groups that people don't want to talk about their problems, their struggles, their road bumps, like somehow they've never had one before, or you won't like someone if they're going through something. I don't really understand it. My life has been a roller coaster. Some of those really high, some of those speedy downfalls felt like there was like barbed wire on one of the tracks. I don't know. Uh, I hear you. There's yeah. always something going on and mm -hmm. it can't possibly be a rosy picture all the time. When I was on the nonprofit board, we came up with one of our donors said something they wanted us to really change what we were doing in order to receive these funds. And we told them right up front, like, we're happy to take your money. We're not happy to change who we are and what we do. Good for you. Yeah. If you want to support us, we really need help in these areas. If we have to change what we're doing, it doesn't sound like you support us or on board with this vision. And we turned away a, a significant amount of money because the money wasn't enough to change who we are as people. But here's the thing, and I love what you're saying. And let's flip it on its head to the donor side. The, what, another thing that can be a real challenge though, is over the years, if you're a donor and you're not getting that feedback without meaning to you can start feeling like what you're saying is always right. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing that's dangerous about it, where you can come into a room, you can say, oh, I've read a couple articles. I really feel like the gap is this that we need to fill or that. And what happens then is I, I appreciate your story where you pushed back on the donor, but that doesn't happen that often. And so what can happen too, is that the nonprofit will either try to make it work. And then we're sort of circling back to the beginning of our conversation. They'll start to try to make it work. Um, and then over a couple of years, it won't. And then the donor will get disillusioned and the nonprofits will get grumpy and that kind of thing will happen. Um, and so let's, yeah, let's talk about some strategies for the donor to make sure that they stay real. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've, I've got one more thing I want to add in before we get into strategies. This sounds exactly like leadership in any organization. Yeah. When I was leading sailors and doing different things in the Navy, I valued, highly valued real feedback. I had a couple of, um, a couple of grumpy bosses, not too many. Most were really, <laughs> were really human. Yeah. I had someone, I, he asked me a question. It's like, you know, sir, I really don't know that. Let me, let me get back to you on this. And he was like, I'm not happy with that answer. I was like, well, which answer would you prefer? He's like, well, I'd like you to know the answer. I was like, that would be great. But any other answer that I would give you would have been me lying to you. And if you're okay with receiving lies as opposed to, hey, you know, I'm not really sure about this. Let me go check. Then eventually people will stop giving you feedback altogether. You'll surround yourself and all you'll see is north and south head nods. And you'll never get the feedback you need to be truly effective. Right, right. And and this is, I really appreciate what you're saying. It's, it, this is not being a, a high a person who's giving money away and being in this bubble, I'm, it sounds like it is, it, it could be a problem in a lot of different leadership issues, leadership situations. Definitely. Definitely. It can be really challenging here because if you haven't as a donor done the work to make sure you're giving in areas that you actually know something about, then that's the added whammy because you're in a funder bubble. You don't really know the issue. If you haven't picked the right issue, that's a real problem. <laughs> so you're really doing it. Badly. Yeah, I appreciate that. Tell me more things. Do you have anything more you want to say before we get into the tips and tricks? <laughs> I, I can cover this a lot of different ways. Uh, I had a really great commander, Mark Brophy, 
Uh, he brought us in and, and the first day he outranks me by a couple. He's got much more experience than me. You know, there's, we have this thing in a lot of organizations called organizational chart. Normally it's the leader at the top and then it gets more and more the further you go down. He drew this out for me and then he flipped it over. He's like, look, I don't run this as a normal organization chart. I'm not the dictator. I have it the opposite way where I'm on the bottom and you guys, you guys know how to do your job. I'm here to support you to remove roadblocks and to make sure you have the tools that you need to, to be effective. He's like, if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. It's my job is not to lord over you all, you know, and we've got too many people in leadership positions that feel like they're still doing. They remember when they were the admin person and they know how to do it. Here's the deal. I don't want to give you the answer of how I did it. Not because I'm withholding, not because of anything crazy, but if I tell you, I can either tell you what to do or how to do it. If I tell you what to do and how to do it, I'm not getting anything new. There's not a chance that I'm going to solve a problem in a new way if you have to do it the way that I dictate that you do it. Right, right. The only way we can solve some of these unsolvable problems, if I give you the space and the trust for you to go out and come back and solve this on your own. I'm not saying I won't help you. I'm not saying I won't guide you. I'm not saying I won't give you feedback or, or speak from my experience. But if I'm telling you exactly how to do it, then we're not, there's no chance we can. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, completely. I really appreciate that, Travis. Yeah. So let's talk about some of this because the, I, I love that. And it's, it's a good segue into what I'm thinking about. So there's two sides to this. One is how can you keep yourself, your personal experiences real enough so that you just keep grounded and keep reminding yourself that like, you're not always right, but that you're in the middle of it and you're having great conversation. And then what are some great strategies of how you want to like actually approach nonprofits so that you can get the most out of your relationship. So let's talk first about ways to just remind yourself or things to do so that you stay out of that funder bubble and keep putting yourself in position in various positions so that you remember what you sh what, what it's like to not be a funder, right? And so the first thing I want to say about how to do that is, you know, Travis, you said you were on a board. Definitely, definitely, definitely get yourself on a board of an organization that you like and that you care about. However, it might be an organization that you're not already funding so that they don't necessarily think of you as a hardcore funder person, but it's an issue you care about is you're getting your feet wet. And, or if you don't have the time to do a board service, a lot of organizations have wonderful volunteer opportunities where you can do things on your own time. They might have outings or webinar series or other things like that. What that allows you to do is if you go in there, not saying you're necessarily going to fund the group, but you go in and you start learning and listening and you hear what other people are saying in those forums, people won't think of you necessarily as a funder because they're working through lots of other things. It's not a meeting that you're having individually with them. So that's a great way to really get to know an, a group and organization. The other kind of thing you can do is think a lot about the time you're spending. So if you've done the good work where the thing that you're funding is something that you already know and care about, put yourself in a position where you're in a leadership role, moving that issue forward if you can. So let's say you're really engaged in your kid's school, volunteer at the PTA, or maybe help coach, you know, help the coach with your kid's soccer or get in there rough and tumble. You know, so again, in a situation where it's something you're doing, something you care about, but it's not that typical funder role. It's, it's more like, cause then what will happen is, you know, people get grumpy with you sometimes. And if you're in a stressful situation, you can be like, this is good. Remind yourself, this is good. And then the last thing is, and I think you said this before, Travis, it's really important to also acknowledge your own mistakes, but not put yourself down, but acknowledge them. And so that when you're in, when you're in these situations where you've put yourself in uncomfortable positions, or you're just learning and you're not already seen as, as a funder, always acknowledge your own mistakes and get in there, get in the weeds that way. For me, let me tell you how I've done that. I volunteered to be on the Oregon board of forestry. So it's a commission that is appointed by the governor and the Senate in Oregon. And I did it in my volunteer time and they, that commission regulates private forest practices and state forest practices, and also works on some wildfire issues and other things. It is an intense place to be. No one remembers that I work for funders <laughs> at all. It's There's a lot at stake, right? 
its regulations for the whole state. And Oregon grows a lot of trees. And I, um, I did that purposefully for eight years so that I could always remember that, you know, this is an important place to be in that way. And now the other thing I like to do is I facilitate meetings. And as, and I do this for my clients, for funders. So it is a little bit still funder bubble-ish. But the thing is, is if you're facilitating meetings and helping organize conferences, people do forget that you're a funder because we're really working through problems together and thinking it through. And sometimes it'll be very stressful and people will be grumpy with me. <laughs> I'll try to figure it out. And I remind myself, no, this is where I want to be, exactly where I want to be, because I need to make sure that I'm supporting people and all the diversity of it, you know? So that's the first thing is, is, is how do we as funders make sure that we're stepping out of the funder bubble? And then the second part of this conversation that I want to have with you is if you're a funder and you are having that straight up one-on-one -on -one conversation or group conversation as a funder, more formally with a nonprofit you care about, there's some key tips and tricks that you need to think about there too, to make sure you get the most out of your conversation. And I have in my mini course, I have like a whole bunch of different strategies and ideas, but the number one thing that I really want to emphasize is that it's really important to listen first and not necessarily come into the meeting with your own idea of where you want to go and say that first. You might come in with a strategy, like, here's what I care about. Here's what I want to do. And you might tell them big picture. I care about X issue. I'm a campaigner funder. I want to move the dial. So definitely do that. But then don't necessarily tell them the solution yet. Find out from them what they see as a solution. That is the most important thing. And then mull on that and think about it and think about how you can help them. But that's key. Now, again, I have lots of other little things, but I, I don't want to overwhelm your audience with all the different pieces because I think that's the most important theme about how to come into a meeting and make it really effective. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Knowing you, Travis, you probably have lots of questions now. <laughs> Well, your, your strategy on meetings is great. It's really the difference between setting your intentions versus setting the expectations or the outcome of the meeting, which you don't have control over. When you set your intentions and you know that you plan on going in with potential solutions and listening, you can control that. If you go into the meeting expecting them to just do whatever you say, good luck having other people read your mind and know what you're Travis, to do. can I tell a story about that? Like sure. there's, there's motive. I have motivations behind all my stuff based on like real life. There was this one uh, meeting I was at where, <laughs> oh my gosh, still makes me cringe. It was, the topic was about jobs and green jobs. So like renewable energy jobs, that kind of thing. So it was a topic, that was the topic. There were about four or five different funders that wanted to learn from the region's experts on this issue. So we called a meeting with the nonprofits and these four or five donors. And I, I helped facilitate the meeting. And one of the donors I invited to come, one of the people who wanted to give money to this cause, this person came into the meeting and they came in really quickly, like they were a little late. They come and sit down and they missed the whole agenda or the welcome, right? So they just come in and sit down. And then they said, okay, green jobs. I just read an article yesterday. Just, that's one of those cuss words, just. <laughs> I, I just read an article by X and Y person on this issue. And they said that this is the solution. So let's talk about that. Actually, he didn't say that, that that part. He just said, they said, this is the solution, right? Mic drop, okay? And first of all, the people in the room, the nonprofits were just like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. So they had to answer that question. And then the other not, uh, donors who actually didn't know a ton about the issue, they just wanted to explore in general. They were, they were just not able to have a voice at all. And the whole conversation was around this one theory of change from this one article from a person who hadn't done the work up front to see if this was even an issue that they knew anything about themselves and they wanted to come in acting smart. So after the meeting, after the meeting, the nonprofits came to me and they were like, what just happened? Like, I know that author and I don't agree with that author at all. And this isn't, that is not the solution, but we couldn't really talk about the real solutions. And so I had to have a whole nother meeting to really like actually figure out what was going on and to talk with the other donors about where to go. And luckily I knew the nonprofits well enough where they could pull me aside afterwards and talk about it. And so then we were able to right track it. Although that gentleman who came in with that idea was grumpy and didn't end up funding the work, but that's okay. I mean, but the problem is, is like, 
they were just grumpy in general then. And they actually pulled out of some of the climate change work and the jobs work because they just felt like, oh, I can't find anything that's really fitting my thing. Why isn't everybody? That's another big thing I talk about in my course. It's fantastic that he got out early and didn't drag it on for you. That's true. I think I helped make that happen. But that's one thing I talk about in my course is if you're a funder and over the years you start going, why isn't everybody, why, why is it when I mention something, no one is doing what I'm saying and it's not happening. And, and I'm frustrated because it's not happening because, you know, everything I'm saying, people are just not hopping to and doing it. You know, they don't usually say it that way. But the thing is, is like, if you start feeling frustrated because the community is not going to where you're going, it doesn't mean that the community doesn't know what they're doing. It mainly means that you might be in a funder bubble. It might mean that they're, they can't really tell you that they're, what the real strategies are because you've been approaching the meetings and the conversations in a way where you're already coming out with the solution to the problem rather than identifying the problem. So that's, that's the key. So yeah, this is so much fun to talk to you about all this stuff, Travis. <laughs> I want to know if you mentioned to your clients, which I'm sure you do, to go get on a board and not as a funder role. Tell me about an experience or feedback that you've gotten from a client that's went and done this. What kind of insight did they gain that they didn't formally have? There's a lot of different pieces to that. The first insight that they get is they really can see firsthand when a nonprofit is struggling and they can have much more empathy for that nonprofit. In particular, one place when a nonprofit, one time when a nonprofit is, well, I'll just use one example. A nonprofit, when a nonprofit is really vulnerable is when they're having a leadership transition. So when a really amazing executive director that everyone loves or director of a program that everyone loves ends up leaving, which happens, how does the board then navigate the transition, especially if it's an executive director? And I've seen this happen on a few occasions, and I'm actually thinking about one in particular where one of the trustees that I work with, who's on the board of an organization that's had some challenges after a really wonderful executive director left, they've had a few new ones come through and it's been tough. And so that means then that when nonprofits that are coming to this trustees foundation for funding are going through a transition, that trustee is much more open to the challenges that that nonprofit might be going through in that transition. So sometimes an, a foundation or a donor, when a nonprofit's going through a transition, will withhold funding because they'll be nervous. But this foundation, this trustee did the opposite. They said, let's lean in, let's support this group as it's going through the transition. But maybe they, and they had good advice on things to think about and how to make it work. So that's just one example, but it's a, I love that example. It's valid, too, because, I mean, historically speaking, by averages, nonprofits are a high turnover yes. job, a high turnover industry. I got the pleasure of interviewing Craig Hanley, who is an expert in that. He runs a call center in Mexico and he run, you know, call centers, historically high turnover rate. He wrote a book called Hired to Quit, Inspired to Stay, and he talks about the way that he builds a culture that even though it's a high turnover industry historically, that he's helping them achieve their goals and their dreams and the way that he treats them as people. <clears throat> Someone else needs to hear this. You know, treat them as other humans mm -hmm. changes the whole dynamic. And his turnover rate, I think, is the lowest in the industry. And the people that do decide to leave to chase their dreams all credit him with the way that he treated them and their individual situation and their dream. So I think executive directors are in like an 18-month loop. You can hardly get to know everyone in the organization in 18 months, let alone do anything spectacular. But we're expecting yeah. people to come in and revolutionize the fundraising of the whole organization within six months. You don't even know all the board members' names yet. What are you talking about? Right, right. Give some people some leeway, some wiggle room, the grace that you would expect to receive feel free to extend the grace to people in those situations. This is another place where it's important to decide if you're a sustainer campaigner or launcher funder. If you're a sustainer funder, the story I just gave, I think is really relevant to you most likely because you care about that organization. You want the health of that organization to stay. And so if you're serving on boards, maybe only one of the many nonprofits you fund or anything else, but you're serving on those boards, you really are getting, or doing volunteer activities, you're really getting a good feel for some of the challenges. And so that means makes you a better funder because you really understand it. If you're a campaigner donor or a launcher donor, the stories I want to tell are actually more personal. So being on the board of forestry, for example, I work for, some of my clients are 
campaigner donors. And some of them are launcher donors. I also work for sustainer donors. But the campaigner donors that I work for, being on the board of forestry really helped me and it helped me to remind me how hard it is to actually move the needle on an issue that you care about. So usually when you, when you care about something that's a big issue and you want to move the needle on it, it takes time to make those changes. And it takes time because for good reason, you want to have compromise. Compromise is key. You want to be able to hear everyone's voice. You want to figure out what are the key things we need to keep and what are the things that we can give. And it's not so easy, clean, through line kind of stuff. And when you're a donor, if you're only hearing the happy stuff and, oh yeah, we can get this and this done within a year or two years and it doesn't happen, you can get disillusioned unless you yourself are putting yourself in positions where you're seeing how hard it is and you're seeing some of the key heart challenges. And even if it's like, you know, when I've worked for campaigner funders that worked on so many issues, not just forestry issues. But it's still a great reminder so that I can just, it helps me stay a little fresh on those things. And if you're a donor, there are ways to volunteer for commissions, to volunteer for these kind of places because people really need you. And so to, you know, to serve and to be part of those things. So that's another key way if you're a campaigner donor to be part of the mix as well. Absolutely. Especially with those campaigns, like the reason Mm -hmm. they're still there is because people haven't solved it yet. Right. 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 It's going to take time. It might take generations. You mentioned earlier about helping funder collaborations. And when you're dealing with some of these bigger issues, that's required. People are like, oh, I want to have a nonprofit impacts a million people, but I don't want to pay myself. Even if it takes a dollar to you know, impact all those people, it's going to take you a million dollars to get it done. Like money is required for these things. So how do you help funders collaborate with other funders and find each other and work towards some of these issues? Yeah, I believe so strongly in that. And one thing that I'm starting to do a lot of is work with donors that have similar interests and help them form collaborations. And there's so many different ways to do it. But I'm, for example, right now I'm working with founding donors who want to found something called Renewal Philanthropy, which is an organization that is working on survivor-driven change. And these folks are focused on ending injustice around the world. And they specifically are focusing on supporting kids who may have been victims of slavery or abuse, and then supporting them to all the way through school, everything. And then, then those folks become the change makers in their community to stop slavery, to stop all of those things that they experienced. And it's so inspiring to me. And when I first started working with this group, it was a couple of donors and they said, you know, we've been funding this for years and years, but on our own, we want to compare notes with other donors. We want to think about, you know, there's, we don't know at all. So let's think about how to make things work better together. And I'm also right now working with some funders who are worried about wildfire So wildfires are increasing in intensity in the United States and around the world. And donors have been funding a lot. A lot of these are emergencies, right? And so they've been funding in their own place. And they're all saying, well, how can we maybe collaborate better together? Because there's about to be in the United States, a lot more public money going towards helping communities here. And as philanthropists, we may not have the dollars that public dollars have, but we have nimble funding. And we want to be sure that we're not like duplicating efforts. We want to be sure that we're aligning on strategy. So I'm working on that right now. We're going to have, a, we're having conversations there and I've interviewed a bunch of donors to think through, do they want to have a more formal collaboration? Or maybe it's as simple as just making sure they're meeting every month to talk about what they're doing and comparing notes. There's a lot of ways funders can work better together. Um, but the first thing, I have a little mini course <laughs> on this as well for donors to think through how to fund. Sybil's got a course for everything. <laughs> I try to, I'm trying every time I have an idea, I try to make it, make a little mini. And I say mini course because they're short, they're easy for people to digest and to think through. The first thing, again, I like to reiterate when I've created these collaborations from scratch, I realize more and more that the ones that are really successful are when the donors come in and they're all in line about whether they want to be sustainer, campaigner, or launcher donors. So for example, the Renewal Philanthropy Group, they're focused a lot on sustainer kind of donating. 
So they come at it, they have groups they really care about, they support them year after year around the world, and they want to collaborate more together to understand and support various nonprofits together. On the wildfire one that I'm working on, that's a problem that all of these foundations are trying to solve. I mean, you can never solve wildfire, but they're trying to like, it's a societal issue where they want to think about policies that will be helpful to the community so we can respond well. So they're a little bit more on the campaigner donor side, but they're all together on that. There was a collaboration that I was trying to start from scratch and I kept hitting dead ends in the beginning because I wasn't as clear. I sort of was like, come one, come all on this specific collaboration. And it was around environment. And I had sustainer donors, campaigner donors, and launcher donors all sort of jumping in. And it it imploded in the beginning until I wisened up and realized, no, 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 this is a group I think that'll be better suited towards sustainer type donors. And so then we sort of rejiggered it. And now it's launched as a sustainer donor group of people who want to fund groups year after year and really think through things. Now they care about environmental issues. They want to move the needle on some of those things, but the main thrust is around, you know, sustainer donating, donating. So that's the first piece of it with collaboration, but you can get so it's, I've seen so many amazing things happen through collaborations when with my, for my clients, when I've participated in donor collaborations, it's really about relationship building. And so like, for example, in Oregon, one of my clients, I work a lot on habitat work And I was at a conference for a collaboration in Washington, D.C., and I met a donor who was, we were literally just having coffee, and he was sort of like, Sybil, I really want to support local land trusts, and I want to collaborate with local donors. And I said, well, I'm working with some local donors out here. And that conversation essentially brought in multi-millions of dollars to our region because we were able to connect the dots. And we never would have if we hadn't been at that collaboration, that funder collaboration, where we were talking and able to sort of strategize together about some gaps that we wanted to fill and and connect the dots between donors. So the magic that can happen there is amazing. And this renewal philanthropy work I'm doing on survivor-driven change, it is so fun because the three founding donors, they didn't know each other before. And we brought them together in this conversation. And now they're really good friends. And we're going to have our first conference next year. And it's great. They're having meetings on their own to try and strategize. And over time, if you're together, you can be really make a difference in the issue you care about. So I can keep talking about that, but I'll stop (laughs) there because it's so fun. It's so inspiring. I, I just collaboration. I can't get enough of it. See, I love what you said there. You said, I tried to do something and it sucked. So we (laughs) tweaked it and now it's better. See, more people need to be willing to share that little bit of the story that says, I didn't know what I was doing when I started. Yeah. And then I yeah. figured it out because the goal was more important than the details. Yeah. Like, I wasn't a world-class poster, uh, podcaster when I started podcasting. <laughs> Some people might think I'm still not one now, but those road bumps, those speed bumps didn't stop me from getting to where I needed to go. Yeah. And honestly, Travis, I think I never would have come up with my sustainer campaigner and launcher idea if I hadn't bumped into that roadblock on that one collaboration I was telling you about, because it made me really realize, oh, there really are different kinds, you know, and it's all okay. You don't have to be one or the other that you can be one of those three, but just name it. Yeah. Name it. It's okay. It's okay to name it. I know that I come off as really rough and maybe even a jerk to a lot of people but it's because of certain things. I don't allow people in my life that are not abundant thinkers. I don't allow things in my life that violate my own boundaries. I immediately say, this is my boundary and don't cross it. I'm not interested in, you know, well, you know, maybe like, look, no, this is my boundary. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much DNA we share. You're not allowed to treat me that way. And so I have very, hard points in getting to know me, but I'm also always going to be me. You're always going to get Travis, unless I'm really tired, then you probably don't want to be around me, but (laughs) there's not a facade here. I'm not pretending to be anybody. And am I going to mess stuff up? Absolutely. Am I going to say the wrong things? 
uh, you can probably bet on it. Like, but I'm going to be there. I'm going to be out there. I'm going to be trying. I'm going to be doing something. I'm going to be an- interacting. And I really love the fact that you're trying and you're doing things and you're willing to share where things are a little messy. And if you listen to Joan Gary's podcast, I hear a rumor that nonprofits are messy and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. totally. Totally is. I always travel towards challenges. It's sort of fun. <laughs> the minute it gets too easy, I'm like, ah, this is boring. Yeah. You're familiar with buffaloes and charging the storm? Oh, no. Uh-uh. Tell me. Yeah. There's a whole con- There's a whole talk out there. Uh, there's two kinds of herds on the plains. One is cows and one is buffalo. Well, the cows, when the storm's coming, they run away from the storm. And what that means is they spend a lot longer in the rain. But when a storm's coming, the buffalo turn and they charge the storm, spending the least amount of time getting wet. Interesting. Yeah. So That's interesting. you have to ask our donors out there, are you a cow or are you a buffalo? I want to know. Let me know. I'll be like, I can't believe I'm admitting to you, Travis, but I'm actually a cow. Like <laughs> I turn, <laughs> I run away from danger and it ends up being a lot. I end up getting a lot wetter than I should have gotten. Like, let me right. know. Drop a comment, send me a message or say, I can't believe you would want people to identify as a cow or a buffalo. <laughs> Apparently you can identify as whatever you want to now. So might as well pick animals as well. That's great. I love, I, I haven't heard that before and I love that analogy. So you should definitely, definitely give me the information more. I want to read that, read about it. Or if it's a talk, I want to know. It's a thing. It's not my thing. I'm stealing the thing. I cannot take credit for it, but I'll find it and share it with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. What else do funders got to know? I feel like we covered so much territory in this. There's so there's a lot of other things that funders can think about. Um, if we're talking to a funder who's just starting out, or even if they've been doing it for a while and they want to like tweak things, the things we talked about, I think are the most important, but there's additional things, of course, always to think about. And that is things around making sure that you continue to do the work to hone in on what it is you care about and where you want to go with your donating your donating strategy. And then the other thing I don't think we emphasized enough is that I firmly believe that you can make a significant difference no matter how much money you have to give away. So while I, in my one-on-one client work, I mainly work with donors that give away anything from 500,000 to a million to two to 3 million a year. You do not have to have that kind of money to make a difference. I feel very strongly about that. You can make a difference at 100, 500, 1,000. Anything you have to give is so helpful to the community. It just matters how you focus your giving. So let's say you care about in your area, folks who aren't able to find enough to eat. A hundred dollar donation to your local food bank can feed so many people. So that's the thing I wanted to also emphasize is you can do all the exercises like the the writing and everything I'm talking about, the journaling, thinking about what you want to give to if you have any amount of money to give away, because I still think it's important and it's important to give back because there's always somebody or some organization that really needs your support and help. And the other thing that's cool is if you start donating, no matter how much money you have to give away, you can also, if you happen to have some time, they'll start giving you, sending you their newsletters and they'll start sending you information about outings and updates. So you'll be able to join that and get to know it better. So that's, I just wanted to emphasize that because I don't think I talked about that enough, but there's oh. so many other really interesting things. It can be such a fruitful thing to do is to give, give your time, your money, your talents, it's just, it's such a great world to be in. I am the happiest person, I think, in the world, probably. No, maybe not in the world, but I am so happy because what I do every single day is talk to amazing nonprofits doing good work in the world. Like, that's what I hear about, you know? Yeah, I'm right there with you. I talk to people primarily that make their money from helping nonprofits do it better. That's who I talk to. You're not kidding about smaller gifts adding up. If you're out there and you want to make an impact and it's not happening in your area, if you and a hundred of your friends get together at 84 bucks a month, you can have a hundred thousand dollar foundation that you can give away money every year. Oh, I love that. That Yeah, that is such a great point. There's a group in my town called 99 Girlfriends and they pool money and then they give grants together and it is the coolest thing. Yeah. Yeah. 84 bucks too much for you. 200 people at 42 bucks 
or 400 people at $21 a month. 21 bucks a month gets you a $100,000 foundation and give away money to impact your community locally every year. You don't have to go crazy with it. If you have enough people with the right vision and a couple of bucks, you can make a big impact. I love that. I have a whole a podcast episode on on my podcast about that too. Like all the different cool ideas you can have to maximize your money <laughs> to help the groups you care about. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I did a little research during the episode and Rory Vaden has a YouTube talk about Buffalo charging the storm. Oh, great. I can't wait to listen to it. Yes. That'll be I awesome. can't wait for people to hear this episode and connect with you. Where can people connect with you, Sybil? So easy to find me. You can find me at www.doyourgood.com. So my business is called Do Your Good for obvious reasons now that you've heard from me. <laughs> or you can find me on Instagram or Facebook at the handle Do Your Good, all one word. You can just, my email's on there. It's really easy to find me, like I said. Sybil Ackerman Munson. I have a podcast that I publish every week and you can find it on any of the streaming channels under Do Your Good or my name, Sybil Ackerman Munson. So I'm looking forward to to talking to your listeners, to re- to having them reach out to me and talking about all this stuff that I live, eat, and breathe. <laughs> Thanks for being my guest today and dropping massive knowledge bombs for all of our different funders on how they can do your good. Thanks so much, Travis. It's been delightful. You've been listening to The Nonprofit Architect. To listen to all our past shows, visit http colon forward slash forward slash nonprofitarchitect.org. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show. Thank you. Thank you.